Well, hello, English 111 students. Dr. Tinsley here. And uh, joining you again in our remote learning environment. Uh, and I know, I know this is not ad ideal for most of you. Uh, you would rather be in face-to-face uh, classes with me, uh, learning English composition. And to be honest with you, I'd rather be face to face with you as well. English composition is very difficult to teach and learn in a remote environment. But you know what? This is where we find ourselves. And so we're going to make lemonade out of lemons and we're going to do what we need to do to, uh, to learn what we need to learn in this class. So hang in there, do the work, listen to these lectures, read your book, do the papers and do the best that you can on your work. Ask questions where you need to. Let's work together to make this uh, this end of the semester as best as we can make it, okay? Today we're going to be talking about argument style, all right? Style of arguments, styles of arguments. Uh, what is your style? What is your style? When people Could somebody read your paper and go, hey, I know that so-and-so wrote that paper? In some cases, they can. There, there are certain people that have uh, flags in their writing that when other people read their writing, they know who's written that. Um, and we all have these flags in our writing. Some are bigger than others. Some are very identifying type of flags. So people read our work. They're, yep, I know that's so-and-so because of them doing this type of uh, grammatical thing or syntactical thing. Uh, but even all, but all of us have little flags in our writing, things that are part of our style. And, and uh, if we were together in lecture, I would uh, go to this next slide here, and I would say, who is this? And you would, some two or three hands would go up and say, this is Slash from the rock and roll band Guns N' Roses. And my next question would be, what is, what are the elements of Slash's personal style, right? His physical style. And Everybody points out the black top hat, the sunglasses, the 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 uh, the jewelry, uh, the the long curly hair, the plaid shirt, uh, the Les Paul guitar. Right? These are the things that make Slash Slash. When we see these things, especially when we see them together, the black top hat, the Les Paul guitar, the sunglasses, the, the long curly hair, we know we're dealing with Slash from Guns N' Roses. There's no doubt about it. This is part of his style. He has elements that make him stand out. So when we think about writing, or really a lot of different things in our lives, but certainly writing, what are the elements of style? Uh, first of all is our personality, right? Who we are and what personality elements we bring to the writing equation. What our subject matter is, right? Uh, oftentimes part of our style is the things we choose to write about. We often will write about certain subject areas and avoid other subject areas. So that's part of our style. Uh, the context or situations that we find ourselves in, right? Uh, some people find themselves um, in certain contexts a lot, and therefore they're writing about certain things a lot. So that's part of our style, our attitudes and our emotions, right? We, that, that, a lot of different things uh, fall under this heading, but who we are, how, how we present ourselves to the world, the emotions that we bring to the page, these are all part of our style. Uh, and the audiences that we choose to write to, uh, are part of our style. All of this is part of who we are as writers, and many more things. These are just a few. When we talk about style, there are two general types of style in writing, and they're very simple, formal and informal. So if I choose a formal style of writing, of course, I'm going to bring all of these things to it, right? My personality, my subject matter, maybe what I write about, the context I find myself in, my attitudes, my audience. But beyond that, I can either write in a formal or an informal style. If I'm writing in a formal style, I'm writing more academically. Um, I'm writing uh, using multisyllabic words. I'm using co difficult concepts, those types of things. My, my writing is going to be much more refined, and I'm usually going to write in third person. And you know that that's kind of how we concentrate in this class. We're looking more at the academic writing style. Now, uh, that's not to say that we never write informally, but... Generally, we're writing in a more formal style. The other type of general style uh, is the informal style. This is more loose writing style, more unrefined. Using We use more colloquial language. We may use first and second person. And, uh, and so a lot of times, though, people think that when you're in an English composition class that an English teacher is going to tell you the, that the formal style is somehow superior to the informal style. And I am quick to say that is not the case. Both formal and inf informal are on even ground. And maybe if I were going to grade the two, I might even say that informal is more important than formal because informal is relates to the audience, audience so much 
uh, more easily. Um, we can close that gap with our audience so much faster with an informal style because we're using the language of the people. We're being real. We're being authentic. And that's, uh, especially in our day and age today, what people are oftentimes looking for. But there are contexts that we need to be able to write and speak in a more formal way. And that's why we teach you that in uh, English composition. We figure that most of you are going to figure out the informal style in, in informal ways, right? But we need to help you figure out the formal writing style in, uh, in this college environment. So we concentrate on that in an English composition class. But that's not to say informal is in unimportant. It's definitely important, and we use it every day. Uh, examples of these two types are uh, formal. I might say something like John F. Kennedy's death, though tragic, is a superb example of how the loss of a popular public figure can positively affect patriotic fervor, corporate empathy, and nationalistic drive. Wow, that's a mouthful, isn't it? But notice how that thesis statement is, is very uses multisyllabic words. It uses uh, very academic language. It writes in the third person, etc. Now, I could say the same thing, right? Uh, in a more informal style by saying, I hate that John F. Kennedy was killed, but to be real, his death brought our country together like nothing else could have. Notice the simpler words. Notice the first person. Um, notice uh, just the more colloquial language that's used here. Both of these say the same thing, but they do it in a different overall general style. So when we talk about style and the words we choose, we need to talk about first person versus third person. We've talked about this in class, so I'm not going to belabor this. But we more third person in formal writing, first and second we find in more informal writing. Um, colloquialisms, um, she's crazy or gotcha or when it rains it pours or it is what it is. These are things that we say in our vernacular, we say in our common everyday language that honestly... Um, aren't really communicating what we want to communicate. What do I mean? What do I mean? She is crazy. When we say that, we're usually saying, oh, she's wrong or she's being silly. But if you interpret that literally, she is crazy, we're saying she's insane. She's got a mental disorder. She's got something that should maybe make her, uh, uh, cause her to be committed into an institution. We're not really saying that, right, when we say she's crazy typically. We're just saying, oh, she's, she's wrong. She's being silly. Uh, these are colloquialisms. Um, when it rains, it pours. What We know what that means, but it, as a statement in and of itself, it really makes no sense at all. When it rains, it pours. Well, maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe when it rains, it just rains. Or maybe it rains, it showers. But, um, and it is what it is. You get it. Those are colloquialisms, and they can be part of our style. Uh, slang can be part of our style. We try to avoid this in formal writing, right? But the bomb or fat or dude or whatever words are being used today in, is, is part of slang. These are part of style or can be part of style. Jargon. Um, now, jargon is just it's very technical language that only a, a, a small group of people are going to know and understand. For example, if I said to you, I was on final approach for the ILS runway 15 at XYZ Airport, and I noticed I had excessive crab in the aircraft, you might think I was talking about the little critter that scurries along the bottom of the ocean. But the problem is the, the crab is a technical term, a semi-technical term used in aviation to mean that the nose of the aircraft is pointed into the wind. Right, So that has nothing to do with the critter on the bottom of the ocean other than it's an analogy, right? As a crab walks uh, sideways, the airplane with its nose pointed into the wind is kind of flying sideways. Um, but that's jargon. That's technical language that only a nuanced group of people are going to understand, i.e. pilots. Uh, connotation uh, or the tone of our writing uh, or what our writing implies, right? This is part of our style, or can be. For example, if I said Hillary Clinton is a leftist demigoddess whose only concern is the, her next political conquest, you would say, okay, that implies that I don't like Hillary Clinton. That implies that I have some kind of negative bent towards her. Whereas if I, was a little, if I were a little more uh, subtle or a little more uh, balanced in my view, I might say something like Hillary Clinton is a successful politician who enjoys the political landscape of America. In both sentences, I've said somewhat the same thing, but my connotation is completely different in both in, in, between the two instances, right? Uh, 
when it comes to style and sentence length, style uh, length of sentences, long versus short versus medium sentences. Some people have long, right, lots of long sentences, some short, some medium. Some people mix the two. I would encourage you to mix the two. Uh, don't write all short, but don't write all long. Mix in medium sen- length sentences. Uh, vary it up for your readers. Um, the complexity of your sentences as part of your style. Uh, Mr. Jones, a man of valor and intrigue of good stock and singularity of purpose, had two life principles he lived by, courage of conviction and candor. I mean, read like that, you might think, oh, it sounds very dramatic, but written out, I mean, that's a complex sentence. You've got dashes, you've got uh, colons, you've got, uh, you know, changes in thought, and that's a complex sentence. If you write in a lot of complex sentences like that, you're going to, uh, you know, you're going to confuse your reader, you're going to wear your reader out. A reading is a hard thing to do. It's a hard endeavor. It's an exhausting endeavor. And if you write complex sentences all the time, you're going to exhaust your readers. Uh, some people like sentence fragments, right? In it. Courage, strength, love, hallmarks of an American soldier. Uh, the p- problem with this sentence is there's no verb, right? So this is an incomplete sentence. It's a sentence fragment. And, um, you know, you want to avoid these informal writing. Uh, some people do this more often than others, and so that might be part of their style. A punctuation can be part of people's style. I mean, we all use punctuation, but some people use certain punctuation points more than others. And we all know what a period does. Uh, ends a sentence, ends a thought. I like ice cream, period. Uh, semicolons, uh, they end a thought, but not as abruptly as a period. They can point to a continuation of thought. So I like ice cream, semicolon, it makes me feel happy. So the continuation of thought, it makes me feel happy, comes after the semicolon. Colons are usually point to something else. They're like directional arrows. So if I say I like all kinds of ice cream, colon, what I'm saying is with the colon, I'm saying, look, look, I'm going to tell you what kind of ice creams I like, uh, uh, what kind of ice cream I like, uh, vanilla, strawberry, chocolate, or whatever. I like anything, right? So that colon serves as almost like a directional arrow. Uh, dashes can serve a lot like colon and can enter or like and be as like directional arrows or they can introduce side thoughts. So, for example, where I used the colon in the previous sentence, I could also use a dash. I like all kinds of ice cream, vanilla, strawberry, chocolate or whatever. And in that case, it's, it's acting as that directional arrow. But I could also use it as to introduce a side thought. I like ice cream no matter the flavor because it's so good, right? So the no matter the flavor is a side thought that I interject in there using the dashes. Ellipses, we don't use a lot, again, in formal writing, but they can introduce a dramatic pause in our writing. Ice cream. Who doesn't like it? You hear that dramatic pause, right? That's what the ellipse is trying to do. It's getting you to slow down, take a breath, and then continue reading. So, all right. And again, these are all style elements. But let's get into figurative language because figurative language is a big part of our style, who we are as writers. So first of all, what is figurative language? Well, figurative language is that language that illustrates concepts by using language that makes them stand out. Uh, It adds color to your writing, uh, and there are different types of figurative language, right? A figurative language create figures. They create images in your mind. So a figurative language allows me to see what it is you want me to understand or see. And that's how, that's my, my definition of figurative language. It creates, it's language that creates figures in my mind. It creates the pictures that you want me to see. And there are two types. There are tropes and schemes. Tropes, uh, they really, they, it's figurative language that changes the meaning of words or phrases. And we're going to get into some different types of these here in just a minute. Schemes are different because they, they're uh, figurative language that change the arrangement of words in a sentence. In other words, they alter the sentence structure in order to create those figures. So tropes change the meaning of words and phrases to create images. Schemes change the arrangement of words in a sentence to create images. So let's get into some different types. You'll understand these better as we get into them. Let's talk about the different types of tropes, and there are quite a few of these. And some of these, There's a lot of overlap in these two, so don't... Um, don't get bogged down in how this one's different than that one. Just kind of learn the definitions of each one. You'll notice there's some overlap in them and differences as well. First one is illusion. This describes one situation by comparing it to another. For example, the meeting was John's Little Bighorn. Now, Little Bighorn was a historical event, right? Um, between Custer, Custer's Last Stand, uh, Sioux Indian, that type of thing. You, you, you get the idea. I mean, you know the histor- historical background for that. But... Um, 
obviously the meeting that uh, John is in is not truly Little Bighorn, but Little Bighorn was a disaster for the United States Army, wasn't it? Uh, it was a disaster for Americans in American history because the poor Native Americans were treated so poorly. Um, and so just a bad period of our history. So what kind of meeting do you think this was for John, right? It was horrible. So this is an illusion. We're alluding to a historical event to describe this meeting that John was in. As we are, if we say the place was a, the place is a dumpster fire when it comes to its day-to-day -day operations. A dumpster fire is hot. It's out of control. It's a bad thing. So this organization, its day-to-day -day operations are out of control, and they're bad, right? So you get the idea. That's what illusions do. Analogies compare two things to show the similarities and or to make a point to further an argument or something like that. For example, driving a semi-truck and being an accountant are not too dissimilar. Both involve keeping ledgers, both require a lot of sitting, and both can be extremely boring at times. Now, obviously, these two professions, driving a truck and being an accountant, are two completely different professions. However, this person is saying... They're comparing the two and looking for the similarities between the two, drawing analogies between them, right? So I hope you see that um, in this. They both keep ledgers. They both require a lot of sitting, and they both are extremely boring at times. And so you get the idea. This is what analogies do. Uh, two more. Antonymasia. It's a hard word, isn't it? Substituting a descriptive word or phrase for a proper name. So when we take somebody's proper name, we substitute a phrase that's more descriptive and creates a figure in our mind. For example, Reagan, Ronald Reagan, was called the great communicator. He was, he was. The, our, our president, Reagan, in the 1980s, was called the great communicator. Now, was that his real name? No, but that was the, that was the antinomasia that was used, right, in his case, to say, hey, listen, um, this guy's a really good communicator. And so he almost like, uh, create this godlike title for him, the great communicator, to give you this picture of this man who's bold and and bra and, uh, and and very confident and competent behind a podium. Um, and so your image in your mind when you when you hear the great communicator is pretty good, right? And that's what they wanted. Or Elvis was called the king of rock and roll. Um, the king was he really a king? No, he was he, he wasn't royal in any way. But when you say king of rock and roll, it brings that royal image to your mind. And you think, wow, this guy must be really good, right? Okay, you get the idea. Hyperbole, that's another kind of trope, is an exaggeration for effect. In other words, uh, for example, the only way to take care of the Korean nuclear threat is to wipe them from the face of the planet. Now, when people say this, I hope, <laughs> they, may, they don't really mean that, right? They're, they're using hyperbole. They're saying, oh, you know, basically what they're saying is we've got to have, we've got to be um, aggressive towards our enemy, uh, we've got to be um, assertive, right? Uh, they're not really meaning let's take a nuclear bomb and completely wipe them from the face there. I'm sure there are people that think that. But most people who say something like that just mean we need to be harsh towards them. We need to be aggressive towards them. Uh, again, I'm not making a political statement on this. I'm just using examples. But most people who say something like that are just exaggerating for the effect. Maybe a better example is the second one here. He's the smartest person in the world. Now, I doubt any of us have ever met the smartest person in the world. But most of us have said something like this at one point. Um, we're using hyperbole when we say this. We know we've probably not met the smartest person in the world. But by saying this, we're saying what? He or she is really smart. That's hyperbole. Um, irony is another type of trope. When you're writing that presents tension or is intended to be the opposite of the literal meaning. So we're presenting intentional tension uh, or we want what we're saying to be interpreted the opposite way. For example, uh, Donald Trump is running the White House as he would The Apprentice. This has been an effective means of management, as seen by his high turnover rate. Now, Donald Trump has had a high turnover rate, which most people believe is a negative aspect of his presidency. When I say turnover rate, turnover rate of staffers and things like that, um, assistants and whatnot, White House staff. Um. This person is saying this has been an effective means of management. But what they're really saying when they say as seen by the high turnover rate is they're saying this is not an effective means of management. Operating like you would the apprentice is not an effective way to run the White House is what this person would be saying. Again, this is not my political statement. This is my statement um, as an example. So do you get it? Do you see the tension that's in there? Do you see that the meaning is opposite the literal meaning? 
Another example. If results are the measures of success, then Hitler was one of the most successful leaders in the tw- of the 20th century. Now, this would have, of course, been early uh, in his quote-unquote career as a as a, a national leader. But uh, obviously, we don't. This person would not, hopefully, believe that Hitler was successful. Uh, so there's a tension here, isn't it? There's a an, a meaning opposite the literal interpretation. I think you get that. Uh, these two these two tropes everybody's familiar with metaphor and simile metaphor comparison using uh, without using like or as and a simile comparison using like or as I don't think I need to beat this uh, point to death right I think we got it all right metonymy metonymy another difficult word when we use objects to represent a particular general concept. Um, for example, the pen is mightier than the sword. It's raining cats and dogs outside. Xerox machines, Washington, Big Brother Banks. Okay, so what do I mean by that? The pen is mightier than the sword. That's just kind of an odd statement, but we know what it means, right? It represents a general concept of peaceful means are oftentimes more effective than military means, right? We get that. Or it's raining cats and dogs outside. I have no idea what that really means, but what it, where that comes from, but I know what it means. It means that it's raining really hard outside, right? These are examples of metonymy. As is Xerox machines. When we say Xerox machines, we don't typically mean the company Xerox. We just mean a copy machine, or at least back in the 80s and 90s. Or when we say Washington, we don't typically mean the city, we're oftentimes, when we're talking political means, we're talking about the Congress, the political machine uh, in, in Washington, D.C. Or Big Brother, that's kind of, you know, intelligence agency, CIA, NSA, those types of things. Or banks, when we say banks, we're talking about the banking industry, like the, the Fed and those types of things. All right, oxymoron is paradox or con- contradiction. We see this a lot. Um, the old, uh, the old uh, joke of parkways. Why do we drive on parkways and park in driveways? That's kind of an oxymoron, right? Or I wrote a paper one time called "A Bright Shining Twilight." If you know anything about twilight, twilight's not bright shining. So I was presenting an oxymoron there, and I think you get those. And then rhetorical questions, questions that are more statements than they are questions or questions that don't require an answer. You know, a lot of times we'll say, well, what do you think of that? And we're oftentimes making a statement of, that's pretty cool, isn't it? Uh, we're not really asking somebody what they think. Or do you see what I'm saying? We're saying, I know you see what I'm saying. I'm just going to make a point of it by asking this rhetorical question. Or can you think of anything more convincing? Now, that's definitely a rhetorical question because what I'm really saying there is there's nothing more convincing than whatever I just said. All right, so rhetorical questions. Uh, signifying is a type of trope. I told you a lot of these. Signifying is a type of trope when a writer takes jabs at another using, usually for humorous effect. Like, you stink, said Fred. Yeah, Courtney responded, maybe, but you're an idiot and I can take a shower. That's a jab, right? Or Abbott and Costello's famous who's on first sketch. If you've never seen that, go to YouTube and type in Abbott and Costello, who's on first. You'll absolutely be floored. It's funny. Okay. Um, understatement, understatement, underrepresenting something's significance in order to make a point. For example, if I said Vietnam was a little war the U.S. fought during the 1960s and 70s, I would be making an understatement because the Vietnam War was a huge, massive war, changed our culture forever. Or if I said Einstein was a pretty smart dude, Einstein was not pretty smart. Einstein was an absolute genius, right? So these are examples of understatement. Now let's talk about some schemes, right? Schemes, changing sentence order, changing sentences, not just words, but sentences, right? And a great example of this is anaphora. Most of you are familiar with this. This is repetition. Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech is one of the most beautiful examples of anaphora in American speech. Um, He says, I have a dream, I have a dream, I have a dream, I have a dream, over and over again for effect, and it was extremely effective uh, in his speech. Or if I said something like, there is no limit to what I can do, there is no limit to what your friends can do, there is no limit to what your family can do, there is no limit, there is no limit, there is no limit. This is anaphora, repetition for effect. Um, 
antithesis, uh, parallelism that highlights contrast. So when I have something that's parallel, but I, but the things, the two things that are parallel are really opposites of one another. That's antithesis. For example, you may think that you are right, but you are really wrong. Uh, you may think that you're right, but you are really wrong. These are kind of parallel types of sentence structures, but they're saying two different things. You might think you're right, but you're really wrong, right? Or we call those who stand up for their conviction strong. We call those who buckle under pressure weak. We call those, we call those, that's the parallelism. But we call those who stand up for their conviction strong, strong. We call those who buckle under pressure weak, weak. Those are the opposites, right? Uh, inverted word order, you might think about it as Yoda speech, right? <laughs> Not very, not very effective in writing typically, but you never know. Into the sunset rode the cowboy and his sidekick. Or teach him I cannot. Too old is he. <laughs> the old Yoda speech. Um, but a parallelism uses similar words or phrases for effect. We, very, you know, can be related to anaphora. It was here, it was there, it was everywhere. When we suffer, we build character. When we build character, we enhance our ability to handle life's issues. When we enhance our ability to handle life's issues, we create resiliency. Notice how each one of those sentences builds on the one prior to it through this parallelism, right? All right. All right. So a lot of stuff, tropes and schemes and uh, and style and writing and how, you know, what is your style when it comes to sentence length and word choice and uh the, the types of figurative language you use. How do you use it? Think about it, uh, you know, as you go through uh, this week. I want you to think about how you write, all right? How do you write? Because uh, I'm going to have you do some type of assignment this week where you're going to reflect on your own writing. What is your style? What are some of the things that you use in your writing. And uh, I don't know if I'm going to do that through a discussion board or through uh, a paper, informal paper that you'll turn in. But whatever we do, just be ready. Um, what's your style? Think about your style. What are some of these elements of style that you use in your own writing that you see in your own writing? Or maybe talk to some other people and what do they see in you? And, uh, and start thinking about that. Reflect on that because we are going to write about it in some way, shape, or form this week. Okay. Have a great week. If you have any questions, let me know. I'm available by phone, email, you get you text, you know. Hey, I'm easy. All right. Talk to you soon. Have a great day.